In today's video, we're going to talk about surplus labor and surplus value. These concepts are central to Marx's critique of the capitalist mode of production, and in general add to the base of important ideas that the rest of Marx's theory is built on. Surplus labor is a pretty simple concept. In Volume 1 of Capital, Marx takes us to the marketplace to witness the capitalist buying the things he or she needs in order to make some kind of profit. For the sake of example, we're going to assume that the capitalist owns a t-shirt factory and needs the necessary ingredients to produce marketable t-shirts. The capitalist is going to need material for the t-shirt itself, some kind of machinery for assembly, and a worker to commit their labor power to running the whole production process. So just like the capitalist buys cotton and sewing machines from which t-shirts can be made, the capitalist also buys the labor power of the worker. This labor power is simply a worker's ability to put in a certain amount of labor in a given time. This labor, as we will see, creates new value. In this way, labor is a unique commodity because of its ability to add value to some object. In our example, the cotton, which becomes a t-shirt. Also, unlike the objects that the capitalist buys, labor is not for sale permanently. The worker hires out labor on a contractual basis. The agreement is that the worker produces the capitalist X number of his or her hours a day, and in exchange, the capitalist pays the worker some agreed upon salary. As the worker signs on to the job, his or her time and labor is given away to the capitalist. However, in order to make a profit, the capitalist has to pay the worker less than the value of what he or she is capable of producing. If the capitalist didn't do this, his profits would flatline. So we see that profit is based on and necessarily needs the incomplete compensation for the labor provided by the worker. If we were to break down the process of any profit-making enterprises, we would get the following diagram as Marx presents it. The M stands for money, while the C stands for commodity. The capitalist starts out with some money. He or she then uses that money to acquire a commodity. Then, the commodity is exchanged once more with money. Marx called this the general formula for capital. Notice that this process is basically the act of buying something with the intent of selling. The process is structured in such a way that it can be set on loop forever. However, some tweaks need to be made to the letter diagram to improve its accuracy. For one, there would be no point in buying a commodity if you couldn't sell it for more money. So our diagram should look more like this. M prime, as it were, represents the fact that the commodity was sold for more money than it was bought for. But what exactly allows the capitalist to sell the commodity for more than he or she bought it for? After all, nobody on the market would buy a commodity for more than it was worth to the seller. Well, Marx argues that we need to make a few more revisions to our diagram. Something happens to the commodity before that selling point. What is that something? Well, this is where labor and tools come in. Remember earlier on in the video that the capitalist bought, alongside the commodity he or she wants to sell off, labor power and the means of production. This is very important to the whole process. We need to insert labor power, the worker's ability to put in labor, and the means of production, the tools or machines, into the equation. We can't leave out any variables. So now we have something that looks like this. We know that LP stands for labor power, and the MP stands for means of production. These represent the worker, the tools, machines, and secondary materials needed to work on the commodity itself. The P represents the production process itself. This is where the worker puts in some elbow grease and mixes the commodity with all the necessary pieces, using the means of production. Out of that process emerges the commodity, but now it's different. It's not just the cotton that was going into the production process. Now it's a full t-shirt with proper stitches, hems, and maybe a collar. The worker's labor is what added new value to the commodity, making it more valuable than its original form. Now when we go from C to M, in other words, when we sell the commodity, we get more than the money we put into it. We get money plus a little something more, added to the commodity courtesy of the worker. This surplus value, as Marx called it, comes from the fact that the worker produces more in value than he or she is given in monetary compensation. The value of labor power, like all other commodities, consists of the items necessary for its production. What is necessary for the reproduction of labor power can vary from place to place. In reality, labor power can be reproduced on a bare minimum compensation. Think of underdeveloped parts of the world, where meager wages are just enough to sustain some kind of existence for the worker, so that he or she can return the next day to produce more value. Of course, in some societies, workers have come together to demand higher wages as well as a slew of other goods and services to improve their quality of life. 
This is one of the reasons why in some parts of the world the cost of reproducing labor is much higher than in other parts of the world, and subsequently this is why so many firms are eager to outsource to cheaper parts of the world. Let's assume a worker needs $20 a day to live a life that'll allow him or her to keep coming back to produce more commodities. This is the fair price that the capitalist pays the worker on a daily basis. Remember that it would make no sense, financially speaking, for the capitalist to pay the worker more than he or she absolutely has to. Not because the capitalists are greedy or evil, but because they need to be as competitive as possible on the market. Competition forces capitalists to pay their worker the smallest possible amount they can get away with, so that they can get the best returns. Let's also assume that it takes one hour for a worker to put together a t-shirt, from start to finish. Each finished t-shirt has a price of about $5. In an 8 hour workday, the worker can produce 8 t-shirts, or $40 worth of t-shirts. The worker therefore spends about half of the working day earning his or her wages, the $20 he was promised by the capitalist from a day's worth of work. The problem for the worker is that there is not a way to check out after making 4 t-shirts. No financially conscientious boss is going to let their worker clock out before the working day is up. So the worker stays and works another 4 hours, producing above and beyond the ticket price of his wages. If the value of labor power was the same as the value produced in the working day by the worker, then the capitalist would break even at the end of the day. Say it took $40 for the worker to live a sustainable life. If everything else stayed the same, the worker would produce 8 t-shirts in 8 hours, creating $40 of potential value for the capitalist. The problem for the capitalist is that $40 have already left the funds to pay the worker, and only $40 were made back, and that's assuming the capitalist was able to sell all the t-shirts on the market. The capitalist has made no money at all. If the capitalist doesn't do something, he or she will quickly go out of business. Finally, we have arrived at the origin point of surplus value. It's the value produced by the worker after he or she has produced the value of his or her wages. In our example, the worker produced about $20 worth of surplus value, which, according to the contract, now belong to the capitalist. Of course, this example is simplistic. For one, the labor process is not neatly divided into chunks during which the worker produces value to earn his or her wages, and chunks where the worker produces surplus value for the capitalist. The working day is a fluid process, especially in conditions where the commodity being produced is more complex than a t-shirt. Oftentimes we can't tell exactly at what point the worker is no longer working for his or her own wages. But that's not really the point of this example. The idea is to reveal the fact that every worker, no matter who they are, produce more than they are given back in wages. In some cases, this difference is incredibly high. Think of the extremely underpaid workers in the underdeveloped part of the world who produce t-shirts for a meager hourly wage, a fraction of what each t-shirt might be sold for in an online store. However, even in places where workers are supposedly paid well, they're still producing more than they are given in wages. The point is that you cannot have profit without having surplus labor and the surplus value that comes out of it. The greater the profit margin, the larger the ratio between surplus and necessary labor must be. This relationship feeds into the natural tendency of society to become increasingly unequal under capitalism. A study found that the top three richest people in the United States held more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire American population. Many people insist that the gap between the rich and the poor is a product of distorted capitalism. There is a notion that our economic system is broken. This is not entirely true since broken implies that what is currently happening is outside of the ordinary. We can see clearly from Marx's analysis that capitalism's very nature creates the kind of inequality we see in the world today. It's not some kind of quirk in the current system that needs to be corrected. It is the system. We don't need to look any further than the incredible gap between productivity and wages in the United States today to find a contemporary example of surplus labor. Since 1973, wages have grown in the United States by 12.4%. In other words, they've barely changed. Meanwhile, productivity, or how much is produced on an annual basis, has grown 77%. Productivity has grown 6.2 times faster than wages. To be sure, we have witnessed consistent economic growth since the 70s. Moreover, compensation did not meet productivity before the 70s. Workers have always been compensated less than the value they produced. Remember, that's where profit comes from. The difference is that before the 70s, productivity and wages grew at the same rate, even if they were not equal in value. After 1973, the growth rates split off noticeably. 
with wage growth flatlining. Now more than ever, what workers produce is not at all compensated in their regular wages. Please leave your thoughts on the contents of this video in the comment section below, as well as suggestions for future videos. Thank you for watching.